I would like to welcome you again, or for the first time, for the second Einstein Lecture 2023. And I would like to welcome you also on behalf of the president of the Albert Einstein Society, Professor Ott, who cannot be with us, unfortunately, today. And I would especially like to welcome uh, our honored guests today. I think it has never happened before that uh, the rector of the university, a vice rector, who will be the next rector, Christian Neumann and Virginia Richter, are here at the same time. So a special welcome from us. Uh, otherwise, the audience yesterday was, uh, I was really uh, positively surprised about the average age. Uh, we were very happy to have so many young people here um, because uh, enthusiasm for mathematics, it's very important to get people when they are still very young. So just to recall, this is the 14th Einstein lecture. We've started out in 2009, it's the fifth in mathematics. And uh, the Einstein lectures are organized jointly by the Albert Einstein Society and the University of Bern. Uh, my name is Christiane Tretter. I'm professor of mathematics here in Bern. And it's a special uh, pleasure and honor to introduce our Einstein lecturer 2023, Professor Marina Wiazowska, who holds a chair in number theory in, at EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. So Marina uh, sets not just one record in our series of Einstein lectures. She's the youngest ever Einstein lecturer. She various other things that I will list maybe not now. Um, but since uh, quite a number of people weren't here yesterday, I will be a bit more detailed than I had planned. Um, Marina was born in Kiev and we had a number of uh, people who met her in Kiev, even people who attended the same school in the audience today. Um, and uh, it's quite impressive how early she started her career there, supported by a dedicated teacher who was a researcher before, if I remember correctly. And then she made her academic first steps also in Germany, back in Kiev, a PhD there, another PhD in Bonn. And then came the memorable uh, month of March 2016, when she had completed uh, the solution of the Kepler conjecture in dimension eight, the sphere packing problem in dimension eight, and posted her single author paper on the uh, free math preprint server archive. And um, from the laudatio that I heard when Marina received a big prize, uh, I, uh, I learned what the reaction in the community was, especially from those people who had tried to solve this problem themselves. So uh, an avalanche of prizes followed that Mar Marina asked me not to list again. <laughs> it's quite many, uh, but I, I have to list the most important one, the Fields Medal in 2022. And um, so we are extremely happy that you agreed to give these three Einstein lectures. And uh, so we are very much looking forward to your second one. Marina has changed the title slightly because I think she reacted also a little bit to the audience, but she will say more about that herself. Please, Marina. Christiane, thank you very much for, the, for another introduction also this time. Uh, so today I will continue speaking about the square packing right. problem. And today I have somehow decided to sh shift to my two second second and third lecture to interchange them and first to speak about the proofs and the uh, last lecture will be about very high dimensions and uh, also possibly about applications of sphere packing according to uh, and so the, the proofs so this was something we already discussed yesterday and since there have been many questions actually related to the proofs uh, I've Like this? Yes. So I have decided to go more into this topic, the topic of proofs. So today's lecture might be a little bit technical, so, but uh, I hope it still will be entertaining. Uh, so the proofs. So here the concept of mathematical proof is actually very ancient. And so this is probably one of the first written mathematical proofs. This is a, a papyrus which uh, contains the 
a part of uh, Euclid's Elements written in Greek. And so here we also can see that uh, this papyrus, it contains a proof of a geometric statement. We also see a geometric uh, sketch here. And of course, the, uh, the whole idea of mathematical proof, it is, I want to say, a backbone of mathematics and very important and also very controversial subject and uh, through history, the, our uh, definition of what, what, is, what constitutes mathematical rigor, what is the necessary degree of rigor, uh, has also changed. And so, for example, we can go as far as formal mathematical proofs when we want to just operate with mathematical level of mathematical logic and prove everything so, so that the proof becomes not like a uh, text, not a conversation between people, but more or less like a computer program. And so here, for example, you can see a proof of the fact that one plus one is two. <laughs> so of, of, of course, the whole not notation, definition of these uh, symbols, it was given on the previous pages of this book. And so now we come to this formal proof that one plus one is two. And of course, mathematical logic, I think it's a, a fa fabulous uh, subject, but also one, one of the, the most terrifying subjects I studied in mathematics, because mathematical logic, first it comes with all this labor which we need to put even to be able to prove very simple things. But then also, as we go deeper and deeper, we, are, uh, we would uh, we discover all kinds of paradoxes and counterintuitive statements. And so, I, for, for me, somehow, the course of, uh, in which we learned on Gödel's theorem, it was one of the most, uh, like maybe, biggest traumas of my life. So, <laughs> so that's why today, somehow, uh, mathematician, modern mathematicians often do, we find somehow middle ground between the uh, rigor but also, the, somehow, I think mathematics is not so much about this uh, code-like uh, statements. It's more about ideas. And so how to somehow convey uh, mathematical ideas that are still rigorous, but uh, appealing to humans without turning into physicists or poets, so to. <laughs> And so to demonstrate to you what, I, what is mathematical proof for me or how mathematical proofs can work, so what I've decided to do today is to give a proof of the pecking problem in dimension two. And I think this is a good choice because the pecking problem in dimension two, it is easier than the pecking problem in dimension three. And of course, it's still much more interesting than pecking problem in dimension one. And also the proof itself, it does not require knowledge outside of high school geometry. So of course also I, I did, I, I, the proof that I give it would not be at this level of details. I would rather to explain you the ideas behind. And so here what we can see on, the, on this slide, this is a, a lake in California which was covered with shadow balls. So here the uh, idea is that somehow the uh, lake was evaporating and it was bad for various uh, reasons, like there is, will be like less water. If too much water, if water gets too hot, then also some disease might uh, appear there. So one of the possible solutions to solve the problem was to cover lake with balls. And of course, when balls are on the surface of a lake, so we can effectively speak of two-dimensional packing problem. And here you can see that somehow the balls, they themselves arrange into this honeycomb configuration. So if you look closely at this picture, we can see the small triangles and hexagons. So this would be this hexagonal packing or regular triangular packing. Or another name it has in mathematics, uh, honeycomb lattice packing. And so, as I hope you remember from our lecture yesterday, so the density of this packing is almost 90%, so even slightly more than 90%. So more than 90% of the area of the lake, in this case, is covered by balls, and therefore water would not evaporate and the water would be preserved. Even though later I learned that this idea of shadow balls, it was, at the moment, I think it was considered as not very 
ecological and sustainable and eventually it did not work for preventing ecosystem, but it, I think it does work very nicely in creating these uh, spectacular images. And so the, uh, this is the uh, theorem which Axel, uh, a Norwegian mathematician Axel Thor, he announced the proof at the end of 19th century in uh, uh, 1890. And so the, proof, the, pro, the problem, the theorem tells us is the densest packing of uh, disks on the plane, of equal disks on the plane, is the honeycomb lattice packing. So the packing we have seen on the previous slide. And so what is the idea? So as I told you, I, I will not somehow try to do it a truly rigorous mathematical uh, proof. <clears throat> But I will try to explain the idea behind, and the idea is rather simple. So suppose that we have an any packing, which means it must be optimal or might be also not optimal. The only rule is that the disks are not allowed to intersect, only allowed to touch each other. And so given such a packing, we will divide our plane into regions. Uh, and we will, uh, we will make, make our division so that in each of the region, the density of a packing in that region should be at most uh, this number, which is the density of the honeycomb lattice packing. And so what I mean by the uh, density of a region, I mean that I look at my region and I uh, com compute the area of the region itself and I computer, compute the area of this region which is covered by disks and take the ratio. So this will give me a de density of a packing of a region. And so now, how do we do this? So what Axel uh, Tue have done, he has su suggested the following procedure, and I, when I prepared this talk, I did not read the original paper of Tue. Instead, I wrote, uh, I, sorry, I was reading a, a review article by Thomas Hales. Uh, so I think there he explains this geometric argument very nicely. So let's start with an arbitrary packing. So here, of course, I don't draw all of the balls which lie on the plane, only a few of them. Suppose that we start like this. So here are these black dots, they are the centers, and these are the disks of radius one. And so now, what we first, first step, what we are doing, uh, we will um, cover our original blue disks with uh, larger disks with disks of radius, which case, so it's, well, this number would work, slightly bigger than one, which is, square, which is two divided by square root of three. And so, uh, so here an important geometric fact is that after we do so, uh, because we started with the packing, we cannot have a point which is an interior of three large disks. So this uh, green large disks, they can intersect. Uh, however, it will be geometrically forbidden for, for three disks to have one common point. So what can happen, the worst case, is that uh, these three large disks, they're, they're limiting uh, circles, they're boundary circles, they can have one common point on a boundary, and this will happen exactly when uh, all of three balls, they form this somehow, we have three disks that touch each other, the same way as they do in the honeycomb packing. And so here somehow I do, like I will not prove this fact for you, but it's, I will leave it to you as an exercise. And so the next thing that we will do, uh, so now, uh, if we have uh, two of these b bigger uh, disks, large disks that uh, intersect each other, uh, then we will look at their centers and we will connect those centers with a segment. So in this picture we see that these two blue, these two green uh, disks intersect, so we connect them with a segment, this, this, and this, and for example, for this uh, green disk it does not intersect with any of them, so that's why it stays unconnected. Okay, and now what we do next, we do the following thing. Uh, so now we look, we choose two uh, 
green disks that intersect each other. And what we are going to do, we are going to look at the, 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 uh, uh, this segment that connects to centers and at this intersection point of limiting circles of these two disks. And so with these two points, we add this third one and we draw, a, here I draw it in red, a red triangle. And we do it for each pair of green disks that intersect. And so now what we have it, uh, achieved like this, uh, we have actually divided uh, our uh, plane into three different, okay, so here something did not render well. Okay, so we have div uh, div uh, divided our uh, plane into three different regions. So I've told you that our strategy is to divide plane into different regions and to show separately that density in each of these regions is at most the density of the honeycomb packing. And so here we have three different regions. So one of them are all the first region are the points that lie outside of all these big green disks. And of course, in this uh, white region, we don't, we don't have any blue disks left. And so there, the density would be just zero, and zero is smaller than the density of the honeycomb packing. So here we are good. The second region is what happens inside of, this, uh, of the <clears throat> green disks and outside of uh, all uh, red triangles. And so here, we can see that actually we can uh, compute what is the uh, density here, and the density here it would be actually the uh, uh, the ratio of the area of a green uh, of, of a blue uh, disk to the area of a green disk, and this would be three quarters because the radius of this uh, uh, of the green uh, green disks was square root of three divided by two, so this would be the ratio and it is smaller than our op density that we would like to pro prove that it's optimal. And so now the most somehow interesting region would be the, what happens inside of these red triangles. And so inside of the red triangles and again it's somehow it would be uh, exercise that I leave uh, for you that inside of red triangles actually the density could be at most this number and so the, the density is, uh, this optimal density is achieved actually when two uh, blue disks they touch each other. And, <clears throat> and also you can think about what happens in a critical situation when we have the honeycomb packing and so if we do have the honeycomb packing then we would see that we will not have any uh, white space left and we will not have, so everything will be covered by this, uh, by the triangles. So in the uh, honeycomb case, what happens is that all this, uh, somehow, the, all, all the uh, air, uh, all the plane will be covered by this green large disks. So they, they, the, some, so, so, some points will be covered only once, some core points will be covered twice, and will be those individual isolated points where three green uh, disks intersect, and no point will be overlapped by all three. And so this is the intuition between, uh, behind the 2S proof, and then somehow it was uh, different, slightly different versions of this proof were written, and there was a quite different proof suggested by Laszlo Feierstoth, where instead of considering these uh, coverings by triangles, he rather studied what is called the Voronoi cells around uh, uh, blue balls. And so now in, the, in dimension three, somehow, uh, so this, uh, the dimension two, it was a playing ground, and then the dimension three, it was famously um, solved by uh, Thomas Hales, and uh, so what happened uh, 
uh, for the proof of uh, Thomas Hale. So he somehow, he's in a very, very big picture. He did, he tried to uh, follow similar strategy, also to divide three-dimensional space into regions where he could bound the uh, density. Uh, however, in three-dimensional space, it turned out to be much, much more difficult. Uh, so, and uh, at the end, so he's, uh, uh, this uh, uh, plan of dividing space into somehow these nicer chambers where we can control everything, the path turned out to be much, much longer. And actually, if you are interested in this, so you think it's worth to read this, short paper, it's an IMS notices paper, so it's a paper which is written not for colleague mathematicians, but rather for general audience. And here actually the strategy is described for the uh, three-dimensional uh, case. And so, uh, but now if things are already so complicated in dimension three, so what can, can we somehow still use this uh, strategy to higher dimensions? For example, to dimension eight or to dimension 24. And here I should say that in principle, nothing forbids that from being possible and maybe this is possible. However, nobody was brave enough to trying to apply this technique to such a big dimensions. I think mostly people are discover, discouraged by this experience in dimension three where everything turned out to be so complicated. And also, yeah, so, so in here instead, of course, instead of working with uh, tri tri triangles or polygons, as nice as they are in a plane, we would have to work with uh, these polytops in higher dimension, and those we don't really understand how they behave. So a new idea is needed, and uh, so okay. So this, and so what this new idea is actually this new idea it existed in. Uh, 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 geometric optimization for quite some time. And the idea is that what we should do, uh, we can use not only, like, so to say, direct geometric approach, we can also use functions. And we can use the dual duality between points in a space and functions which are defined on that space. And what we can use, we can use the whole power of harmonic analysis. And so, so here is this uh, method of harmonic analysis, which was, so it was somehow the, um, these ideas, they existed in uh, mathematics for quite a long time. And so mathematicians who were able to uh, apply these ideas to the sphere packing in uh, Euclidean space are the uh, Henry Cohn and uh, Noam Elkis. And so here, unfortunately, uh, unlike the proof of Axel II, probably I will not be able to explain a Fourier analysis in uh, one popular lecture. So here I will I allow myself even more hand waving than uh, before. So the idea is uh, actually it, it, uh, the, the following. So uh, let's define a special function on, on a Euclidean space. So instead, instead of trying to divide a space into these like, nice regions or nice chambers, uh, what we will try to do, we will to try to define a function on a space. And we want this function to satisfy certain constraints. For example, our fun uh, the function that uh, Cohen and Elkis have uh, thought about, it, it, it uh, should be non-positive outside of a big ball. And so how the way I can think about it is the following. So suppose that we have our configuration of points which are centers of our packing. And so this each of the points, it sends a signal to all other points. And the signal depends only on the distance between from, a, from our original point to another one. 
and somehow if uh, another point is too far away, is, if another point is far away, then this, the signal it would be some real number. And if the po another point is too far away, then the signal would be, okay, so maybe, let me show you this. There are, this is, so this is our point, it sits in Euclidean, in Euclidean space and it sends this signal to all its neighbors. And somehow if the point is uh, f uh, enough and uh, far enough, then it sends it a negative, some negative number. It's just like, okay, you are far, far enough, you're okay. And if a point is close, then it could send it also something positive saying that, no, you are too close to me. And so this is what, uh, this condition in the cohn elkis uh, theorem is about. And so, but that's not en enough. So here, this is where the Fourier analysis comes into play. And so this, we had a signal like this, function f, and now we turn it into something different another function called f hat, which is the Fourier transform of f. And what this function is about, it, it actually tells us which, uh, like this perfect signals, perfect harmonic signals contribute to this function. And so this condition of positivity, what it means, uh, it also has an interpretation in uh, this picture. So what it would mean, it would mean that if we have, uh, take one point and c f f count all the signals each point have sent to, to its neighbors. And we we'll, uh, compute the sum, and then we take the average over all points. And then this average, so the condition that the function f hat is non-negative, it means that this average signal for that each of the points have sent has to be non-negative. <laughs> and so here we see somehow there is a contradiction between these two conditions. It means that if all somehow points are far away from each other, they send each other this signal which is a negative number and in our uh, world it means that you are, you are far away from me. At the same time, the average number has to be non-negative. And so this is one of the very fundamental uh, facts of mathematics. If we have a lot of negative numbers and compute the average, it has to remain negative. And so it means that if we could uh, manufacture a signal like that with these two properties, it will create somehow this contradiction for points being too far away. And so if we were able to manufacture a signal like this, uh, this would mean that uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that uh, packings that are too good are simply impossible. And, uh, and so this is the proof of the cohn elkis theorem, as today's lecture is about proofs. So let me tell you what uh, somehow proof by mathematicians that I usually show to my colleagues in the conferences look like. So it often, it goes like this. So here x is our set of points and uh, we assume that we uh, were able to achieve, so we first assume that we have this special signal that we were able to construct somehow and that we also have a set of points which is a very good packing, somehow which is too good to exist. And so this is a technical condition which tells us that it will be easy for us to define what the average means. And so then we start with some computations, some horrible symbols, and usually mathematicians are very happy when they see these formulas because they, then they would say, oh, okay, yes, now, now it's all clear how that, how that works. And so but what, what the meaning of these formulas is, is actually what I have just told you. It just means that if our function, the signal f, it satisfies those special conditions, it would mean that the average over all, uh, all of these communications between different points has to be uh, non-negative. Non and, uh, and so here we come to the, somehow, come to the contradiction. So here we can bound this, the number of uh, 
the density of our configuration. And so, yeah, so he, here is the, the picture again, how that actually, ha, 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 how I think about this uh, point sending signals to each other. And so the method suggested by Kohn and Elkis, it worked quite nicely. Uh, so what they have done, they've tried this method in uh, various dimensions. So they have tried it in dimensions from 1 to uh, 36, so originally in 2003, but then somehow since this method exists, then other computations were also performed later. It became, it was just a matter of, uh, so to say, uh, ability to program and computer power. So they were searching for the special signals uh, by a, also by, by a computer, by a opti certain op optimization process. And what they found that this method is not bad. In many dimensions it gave uh, it, results which were better than previously known results. And somehow interestingly in dimension two it worked almost perfectly. In dimension three it, it did not give the perfect result. It gave only some estimate for the sphere packing but was not as good as the theorem of uh, the Thomas Hale, and uh, uh, then in many dimensions, again, the, 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 there was a new, obtained a new bound was obtained. It was better than other bounds, and mathematicians who work in this kind of geometric optimization, they are competing who can, if we cannot solve the problem completely, then we can compu compete on who can prove better bound. And so, uh, and the amazing discovery that they've made is that in dimension 8 and in dimension 24, uh, their method gave almost perfect result. So what they were able to prove that if in dimension 8, if we would be able to improve the E8, the, uh, E8 lattice packing, then the improvement could be only by this much. So if something, so they could not completely exclude the possibility that nothing better can be done, but then if it's better, then it's only teeny tiny better. And similar result was obtained in dimension 24. Here also, some of the numerics was not as good as in dimension eight, but still pretty good. And so also this, this are results from the paper of 2003, and the, at the later years, they were actually, <coughs> Uh, what they have uh, done, they have computed, uh, somehow, uh, improved their computer program, which uh, gives this good signals, and they could find a function which even, um, uh, they could find uh, function which proves that nothing can be better than E8 lattice as one, and then 60 zeros, and only then some significant digits. And so what was my contribution to the field? It was that I was able to find this special function, which uh, uh, is not only a numerical approximation, but also satisfies the condition of Cornelke's theorem explicitly. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, exactly. So in the uh, E8 lattice, if we norm normalize it so that uh, per unit of volume we will have only one point of a lattice, then the distance between uh, different uh, points of a lattice would be uh, square root of two, and so we can pack uh, balls of radius one over square root of two in dimension eight. And so this function, it somehow, it was able to replace this one and many, many zeros so to say, by a mathematical one. And then we worked together with uh, uh, Henry Kohn, Abinav Kumer, Stephen Miller, and Daniel Ratchenko, and we were able to prove a similar result for uh, radial Schwartz functions. Oh, uh, sorry for dimension 24. So here we obtained this function for the uh, Leech lattice. 
And in the Leech lattice, the distance between two different points is uh, always bigger or equal than two. And so the, 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 that's why this is the optimal condition in the cohn elkis theorem. And so, and this is how the function should look like. Uh, so this is the profile, this is the signal that uh, points are supposed to send to each other uh, depending on their uh, distance. <clears throat> so that we can uh, uh, prove that the, the density of uh, uh, the packing configuration cannot be bigger than the density of the E8 lattice. And so now I can answer your questions.